So hello everybody, this is Bhante Joe here, and I'm just here in Sri Lanka at Sri Jayasumara Ramaya Temple, which is Bhante Ratanasiri's temple in, uh, in the south of Sri Lanka. And so I thought to record a short awada for the internet, just in case. So I thought that maybe we could start with just a little bit of meditation, so we can lean forward a little bit and arch the spine, and look about three feet in front, and close our eyes. And can think thoughts of goodwill, can spread thoughts of goodwill to our right hand side, wishing may all beings to my right be happy and at ease. May they put in place the qualities necessary to be happy and at ease. And we can make our mind infinite, can make it unbounded all the way to the ends of the universe and beyond, in every dimension. May all beings to my right be happy and at ease. spread thoughts of goodwill to our right hand side and our left hand side. May all beings to my right and my left be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. spread thoughts of goodwill to our right hand side, to our left hand side, and in front. May all beings to my right, my left, and in front be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. Spread thoughts of goodwill to our right, to our left, in front, and behind. May all beings to my right, my left, in front, and behind be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. We can spread thoughts of goodwill to our right, our left, in front, behind, and above. May all beings to my right, my left, in front, behind, and above be happy and at ease. May they put in place the qualities necessary to be happy and at ease.
spread thoughts of goodwill to our right, our left, in front, behind, above, below, all around in every direction, everywhere. May all beings all around in every direction, everywhere, be happy and at ease. May they put in place the causes necessary to be happy and at ease. And we can make our minds infinite, can make them unbounded, all the way to the ends of the universe and beyond, in every dimension. May all beings all around everywhere be happy and at ease. Discussion for the internet. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddham sarananga chami dhammam sarananga chami sangam sarananga chami. Dutiyampi buddham sarananga chami, dutiyampi dhammam sarananga chami, dutiyampi sangam sarananga chami. Tatiyampi buddham sarananga chami, tatiyampi dhammam sarananga chami, tatiyampi sangam sarananga chami. So, hello everybody, this is Bhante uh, Joe, as I said, and just here in... Um, uh, at uh, Bhante Ratana Siri's temple, had uh, come down to the south here uh, to uh, visit Bhante, um, whose temple I uh, would often go to and stay at in, uh, in Toronto. And it's been a kind of, uh, it's been a pleasure to have the chance to pay respects to uh, senior monks down here. And uh, inspiring to see the strength of uh, Buddhism here. So there's actually a really large stupa over there to the left. And uh, just beyond that is a large kind of Bodhi tree. And then there's this shrine here, and behind that there's another shrine. And there's a big Dhamma hall down there. And uh, this is kind of in the south of Sri Lanka near the beach. And so a few, uh, maybe about a month and a half ago, um, uh, I had uh, gotten a message from uh, Gratjana, who lives in Toronto and uh, asked her if she uh, had any questions she might like to see a video recorded about. And so she said that um, she had, uh, was thinking about the precepts at that time. And uh, one of the ones that I guess had come to mind, just kind of paraphrasing the question here, was that uh, the precept against uh, not eating, was uh, not eating afternoon was tricky to follow and more challenging than might have expected. So I thought maybe do a little uh, dumb discussion on that. So I think your question was mainly about that precept was, um, was uh, is that, uh, does one get kind of more used to that? Like the kind of uh, feeling of hunger uh, that comes from keeping that precept? Or um, uh, does the feeling of hunger just kind of go away as one keeps it more? That's kind of as I remember it. And so yeah, so there's basically two sets of precepts. There's the, for lay people, there's the five precepts and the eight precepts. The five precepts are ones that people keep all the time. Uh, lay people are uh, the Buddha's instructions to keep them all the time. And the eight precepts are ones that are uh, traditionally kept on the moon days, which the Buddha really emphasized as being uh, very important. This brings the aspect of renunciation into people's lives, into the lay life. And so, one of these eight precepts that's kept on the moon days is uh, to refrain from eating afternoon. So maybe I'll just go over the five really quickly so that uh, you know people get the context. But the five precepts are you know not to kill anything, basically even bugs. Uh, not to lie about anything basically means uh, not uh, willfully uh, telling a mistruth. 
and uh, not to uh, basically to be fit for one to be faithful in one's relationship basically means not um, cheating on one's partner, not um, not having for one not to have relations with minors, with people who are um, uh, monastic. For uh, let's see, I think yeah, that's or people who are kind of uh, under the minors category. People who are protected by their parents. Um, these kind of things. <coughs> and another one is uh, not to uh, sorry, we got uh, not to steal. Uh, anything, basically not taking not taking anything that isn't given, and the last one is not to take any intoxicants. So then, traditionally, these are kind of uh, five precepts that lay people keep all the time, and basically form the mold for a lay life. They're the, they're said to be the things that lead one to uh, human rebirth, at uh, at least. If this is the kind of prerequisite for being a human, if one keeps these five precepts, then one's developing a mind, the mind of a human being. And kind of, if one starts breaking them, then one starts to develop the mind of an animal. So remember, or a hungry ghost, or a being in hell. And it's this mind that one develops that as one, after one dies and leaves this body, that kind of, um, that kind of momentum of those actions carry one on to whatever rebirth. So these five precepts are said to be what leads one to a human rebirth, um, uh, at least, or maybe even a heavenly rebirth. On top of these five precepts, traditionally in the Buddhist time, um, which he strongly recommended, was there's, there was these, uh, they, their calendar went by the phases of the moon. So <clears throat> every week there would be a half moon, either a new moon where there's no moon at all, or the moon would be half growing, and then a full moon. Then it would be half fading and a new moon, like this. And this would happen roughly once every week, although it seems kind of like advance every maybe two weeks or so, the day would be one day later. And so it doesn't match the solar calendar exactly. But on these new moon days, one would take on additional precepts, which were kind of renunciant precepts. So these precepts are what um, what uh, basically help to support one and not just kind of uh, being a good person, but actually taking one's mind away from the world and kind of taking one's mind uh, away from dependence on external things so much. And these precepts are ones that support the development of meditation, support the development of spiritual cultivation, in addition to the five, which basically, you know, more or less keep one a good person. So the one precept which brought Chana, uh, so basically on that day, I'll maybe go over those quickly, the, the precept about um, not, for one not to cheat on one's partner, about basically not engaging in improper relationships, that gets changed to complete celibacy. So that on those days, people don't uh, even, you know, even holding hands with a partner, uh, all these kind of things, uh, you know, even uh, for one to, uh, even for one to kiss one's partner, that would, one would refrain from those on those days. And basically for that day, one becomes almost like a bit of a renunciant a bit of a, uh, kind of a, a little bit of a monastic in lay life. And then the other one, uh, the other, there's, a two, there's basically a few more that get added. One is not to engage in entertainment, um, adornments and beautifications, so basically no TV and <coughs> no makeup on those days. Another one is to sleep on a low bed. There's basically like eight finger breaths or under, or to sleep on the floor. And one of them is to not eat after midday. So basically from dawn till midday, one doesn't eat. Or sorry, one eats only from dawn until midday. Doesn't eat from after midday until the following dawn. And so it's kind of interesting, when I first came to the monastery, um, I was, uh, you know, before that I was really into kind of, uh, sometimes into exercise, lifting weights and these kind of things. <coughs> Remember, Trying to go from eating um, three meals a day, or like uh, six meals a day, <laughs> or however many, as a bit of a grazer, uh, many meals a day, to eating, uh, just eating from, brec eating breakfast and lunch, um, no matter how much I tried to eat, I kept losing weight. And so I think at that time I lost uh, maybe 20 pounds from what, uh, from the weight that I was before. And um, I remember 
being very difficult. Sometimes I try to pack in all this food, <laughs> eat as much as I could. But uh, despite trying to pack in all this food, you know, your stomach can only take so much and then uh, that's it. So one of the interesting things about that precept was that after a while, that um, the, the feelings of hunger, after a few months, one's weight tends to stabilize around that. And kind of, you lose maybe 20 pounds or whatever, but um, after a while, you're kind of, uh, your weight stabilizes. You know, kind of maybe I was... Uh, and then maybe even after a while, your metabolism might slow down and uh, you gain back a little bit of that weight. So there is this element of the body getting used to it. There's also another element which is a kind of mental element. It is kind of, uh, you know, you mentally get more used to um, going without food. Uh, some of those different aspects of food, in some cases, if one is a very active lifestyle, uh, kind of doing a lot of like going to the gym and swimming or whatever, then there's this element of uh, eating in the evening, which you know you kind of you maybe your body needs to maintain the muscle mass to do a lot of these activities. So there is this kind of element. There is another element though in which people eat in the evening as kind of like a distraction, you know, kind of like a hard day after work, and you know have some ice cream or have <coughs> some I don't know whatever it might be, you know, go out for a meal. Uh, socialize with friends at meals, these kind of things. And so there's nothing kind of uh, really necessarily like evil about that. It's kind of, these precepts are renunciant precepts because they, um, they take one's mind away from the external world. It doesn't mean it's like evil to have an evening meal. But what one tends to find is that one starts to cut that off uh, once, if one does that once a week on the moon days, then what one might find is that, you know, this aspect of food is also tied up in with uh, other aspects of things, and kind of one's attachments to friends. You kind of go out for dinner, everybody's eating, that's a way that um, one socializes. Uh, one might find it's uh, tied up with one's, um, you know, one's kind of attachments to relaxation, kind of what it is that makes one feel relaxed. Basically, kind of distracting oneself, maybe eating a bag of chips while watching a movie. And it's kind of like, you know, I deserve this after a long, hard day's work. And, uh, you know, it's kind of this pleasure of, uh, of being, uh, being a bit distracted. <clears throat> Again, nothing, it's not necessarily like an evil thing to eat chips after work or anything like that. But when one uh, starts to want to find more stable sources of happiness, then these aspects of food, this mental aspect of food, where one's rushing out and using food as a distraction, using food as a means to uh, generate uh, friendships with other people and kind of get socially engaged, um, kind of using food in basically a way that it sends one's mind out. It sends one's mind out to the external world. When one wants to turn one's mind towards meditation and find more stable sources of happiness, one has to go away from these things. So the other thing that one gets used to with this precept is basically it goes hand in hand with renunciation. As kind of as one develops meditation more as part of one's lifestyle, then this precept of not eating afternoon supports that. It supports meditation because for one thing, one isn't using food as an external distraction. So then when one uses one's, uh, one sits down to meditate, then one has less of this distraction. One can more easily stay with one's meditation object. The other thing is that, um, uh, uh, is that uh, food, like eating a lot of food, can make one's body very physically heavy, you know, kind of, and can like obstruct the flow of breath, it can obstruct uh, you know, one's ability to concentrate. And so that's what one might find. One eats a really big meal and sits down to meditate. It isn't just that one might get full and fall asleep, but it's also this kind of discomfort that's there in the body. So I think, you know, even in yoga, people maybe don't, uh, don't do yoga on a full stomach. Even, I think, lifting weights, people don't do on a full stomach. So what one tends to find is that if one stops eating in the afternoon, then one's food is all getting digested throughout the day, and basically it's much easier to meditate, much easier to use that as a topic of meditation. So hand in hand with this, as one comes to try to find more stable sources of happiness, wants to rely less on the external world, more on internal happiness, then this precept is support. So this might actually be the most, one of the most difficult aspects of keeping this precept. 
the physical aspect one gets used to, but when one keeps that once a week, it pulls one away from these external things, pulls one away from one's external attachments to the world. And the way that dealing with that can become easier for a person is if they start to learn to put more of their weight on the Dhamma, more of the weight of their happiness on the Buddha's teachings, on practicing the Buddha's teachings, on practicing meditation. Then this preset becomes a support instead of, uh, instead of kind of like something that one feels is lacking. The nice thing about all of this too is that actually not eating afternoon is something that's apparently really healthy. I think scientists have actually in Gretchen's message, she said that's basically intermittent fasting, which I think scientists are finding is very healthy for keeping the body cleaned out, which actually the Buddha mentions when he laid down this rule. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be easy thing to do. Uh, kind of actually when the Buddha instituted this rule, uh, there was a monks who didn't want to do it. And they <laughs> kind of rebelled against it and didn't, uh, didn't want to do that. But uh, one might find that as one continues to keep this, it just becomes more natural, like anything else. One's body physically adjusts, however much weight one loses from that, one adjusts to that. And that might make one uh, say less uh, physically, you know, that could make one less physically attractive, kind of pull one's mind away from that aspect of the external world. Um, it can uh, make one less socially engaged, pull one away from that aspect of the external world. It can make one less reliant on distraction, it pulls one away from that aspect of the internal world. And in pulling one away from these things, it creates space inside, a space for one's meditation practice to grow. And so when one learns to rely more and more on one's meditation practice, this mental aspect becomes easy. And the physical aspect can also come to be seen as a support. A support for a healthy body, one thing, but also a support in that one isn't weighed down by these feelings of hunger. So another trick that one can do for this actually that's, uh, that's really good is when one feels hungry uh, after stopping eating in the, uh, in the afternoon is to drink water. Let's keep drinking water until uh, that feeling of hunger subsides. And this also is good for physical health and doesn't weigh down one's meditation. It can help to clean out one's body. So in all these ways, the keeping of this precept, although it maybe takes a bit of getting used to uh, at first, is definitely something that people can get used to. And not something that as a lay person one has to keep every day. Uh, but every day is for the five precepts. But once a week, Keeping these eight precepts is something that's a huge support to one's meditation practice. It's actually uh, the thing that one of the things that seems to come across most strongly that the Buddha recommends for lay people. Um, the maybe the strongest support they can keep in their meditation practice, uh, or strongest uh, sila support besides the five precepts. This is their kind of renunciation, renunciation that helps turn their mind away from external things, turn their mind towards internal things so that they can find more and more stable sources of happiness. And these stable sources of happiness lead onwards on the Buddhist path, because the Buddhist path leads inwards, leads onwards, leads onwards from happiness searching and external things, towards trying to find a happiness that doesn't depend on anything at all. And that happiness is Nibbana. So this precept of keeping uh, not eating afternoon, keeping that once a week, is a huge support. And there are these ways that one can get used to it, that one can make it beneficial, that one can integrate it into one's life, so that one's meditation practices flourishes, and one grows in the Buddhist teachings. Okay, so I think that leave that for reflection, and hope that everybody has a great day, wherever it might be, and wishing you all the best till next time.